Okay, so next up, um, we have Lone. So Lone began his career as a freelance e-commerce developer in France, um, specializing in building fast e-commerce experiences. Um, he soon founded Outgrow, um, which was a company specializing in kind of React, Next.js, oh, sorry, Node.js kind of uh, projects, um, which was later acquired by Trellis, where it works today. Um, so some of you might already know that the, well, BigCommerce provide the, um, the checkout as an open source uh, repository, and you can build on it from there. Um, it's all React-based, so I think that Loan's perfect for this talk. Um, and so he's going he's gonna to share with us his experiences about creating a bespoke React checkout experience. So Loan, do you want to take over the screen share? Absolutely, yeah. Thanks for the intro, Andrew. Right, show my screen right here. Okay. Right. So, um, thanks again, Andrew. And, uh, today, as you said, we're going to talk about crafting the ultimate checkout experience, um, using checkout JS, which is an open source project that's uh, applied to us by the, the people at, uh, at big commerce. So you might be wondering who's this guy anyways, and, uh, Andrew, you, you made a great introduction, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But um, fun fact is two years ago, I knew absolutely nothing about big commerce and now I'm here. It's funny how life works. Um, I am still not the biggest uh, you know, big commerce expert out there. I actually, funny enough, worked more on headless builds and just using the storefront API and building custom checkout projects, which we've done quite a bit at, at uh, Trellis. Uh, than, than anything else, you know, I'm not, not a stencil guy uh, by by any means, and uh, I definitely don't know, you know, a lot of the background of big commerce and still fairly new to the ecosystem. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I think Andrew gave all of the details, uh, early on. So let's talk about checkout. We've all seen this, right? We've all seen the same checkout experience on every single store out there. And when it's a Shopify site, you recognize it instantly when it's a big commerce site. You recognize it instantly and it's always the same thing. Everybody has the same. Um, it's funny because a lot of companies, especially on big commerce, invest a lot of money building very custom, you know, extraordinary headless storefronts to get a, this, this amazing, very unique, very bespoke customer experience. But then they redirect people to the checkout and it's just the same as everybody else. And to me, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so if you want to different, you differentiate, yourself, you differentiate yourself from everybody else out there and you want your checkout to be unique, then you, you have to spice it up a little bit. Um, and to do that, you use checkout JS. So as I've written here, checkout in my opinion is a frequently neglected functionality. And I think that it's, it's actually the, the most important in an e-commerce site, right? The thing about checkout, that's really, that's really where the, you know, it's where the money is going, you know? It's, it's where all the action is happening, really. If you've, if you've taken a customer all the way to checkout, um, you can't afford to lose that customer at this point, right? It's, it's that person's already invested in going all the way and buying your product as a retailer. So you better make sure that your checkout experience is, is as good as it gets, right? Uh, so you might be wondering why bother? Why create a custom checkout? It's going to cost an arm and a leg. Why not stick with the tried and true fuck big commerce checkout? Well, it provides a consistent experience between the storefront and the checkout. Again, if you've built this amazing storefront, um, a headless storefront, or it could be, you know, just a, a really, really nice stencil storefront, um, it would be a shame if, you know, all of that design work kind of stops after you go past the cart. Uh, and all of a sudden you transport it into a, a you know, different page, looks like a different site. It doesn't even look like it belongs to the same brand, or maybe there's some of the branding elements, maybe there's some of the colors and the logo is there, but that's about it, right? It would be quite a, quite, quite a shame. So you, mu you match brand identity as well. Make sure that you're, uh, you know, you're using the right uh, typefaces and whatnot. And it gives you a lot of control, right? Um, ultimate control, I would say. You can also use a uh, custom React component library, if you are already using a React component library internally, uh, a lot of companies will have design systems uh, that take the form of a React component library that's private, um, and they want to use that across 
all of their projects, um, whether they're storefronts or checkouts. And in that case, Checkout.js is your only option. Um, you can also implement custom functionalities. Buy online, pick up in store. Yeah, I know there's apps that do that, but if you want to do it custom, if you have, I don't know, middleware, for example, uh, that does some custom work for you, et cetera, it might be the best option. It might be actually the, the simplest way to tackle it. Uh, loyalty programs, upsells, things like that. You're not relying on apps anymore. You've got full control over it. Um, in general, gaining full control is kind of the team here um, so that at the end of the day, you can be unique, differentiate yourself. So introducing Checkout JS. Um, it acts as a starter kit, which means that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. And that's really what I love about it. Uh, you're building with React. It's technologies that a lot of people know out there. You're not going to struggle finding developers or agencies to work on it. Even if you, you're a retailer and, and you change agencies after somebody's built the checkout JS experience for you, uh, you're not going to struggle passing this on to another agency. Everybody works with React. It's the widely accepted standard out there for uh, you know, a, a rendering front end, front end library. So it's really as standard as it gets, and it compiles into a static JavaScript bundle. You don't have any, you know, of that complicated, you know, server side stuff, or server side rendering, and all that that you might have with Next.js, which I love. I'm a big fan of Next.js. But for anybody who who wants a lightweight start on the React, that it's as good as it gets. You just get a static JavaScript bundle, and then you deploy it with WebDAV, which is basically FTP 2.0. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you've, uh, done PHP development back in the days, yeah, yeah, you connect with Cyberduck and you deploy your checkout that way. It's literally, that is how it works. Super simple. So how do you get started? Uh, cause I know we've got a room full of developers here. We want to get to the meat of the matter here. So, um, you would clone the open source, uh, repo or actually you would fork it. If you intend on making modifications, keeping track of the, the upstream and all that. Uh, you, you would do a fork and then clone your fork locally, um, CD into your directory, NPM install, run build, and then run your dev, uh, build and run your dev server. And that's it. Then you've got your checkout running. And the next step is simply to configure your big commerce store to make sure that it's going to render your checkout, which is now running on your local host and uh, replace the built-in checkouts. So for that, you're going to go into settings, advanced checkouts, custom checkout settings. You tick that little box right here, custom checkouts and provide that script URL, which as you can see here is running on your local host. So that would be for like development mode. I would advise, I would tie back into uh, Sabina's talk right here, but I, I would advise that you have two different stores, especially if your client is doing UAT at the same time, you're late in the project. Uh, you don't want your, your checkout to show a blank page on their computer because they're not running the server. So you might want to have two stores to kind of separate concerns there. Um, that's, that's how we do it. Or you uh, work on a schedule, for example, in the morning, it's going to be local host and the devs can work on it. In the afternoon, the client can do UAT and you revert that back to the hosted checkout. But it will be rendering a blank page if somebody tries to go to the checkout and you have it on that local host setting and they don't have it running on their computer. Uh, there's also ways to, to, to work things out. Uh, if you, if you want the best of both worlds, you can have, you know, uh, custom, custom DNS, uh, or, you know, uh, alter the host file on your, uh, developers machines. That's also possible, but I'm not going to get into that, uh, too, too complicated. And if you are the kind of person to think about these solutions, you probably already know how to do that anyways. So once you've done that, you're now rendering your, uh, Check out on localhost on your own machine. You can work on it. Uh, you know, get it ready, fine tune it. It's uh, it's it's actually a, a great checkout flow out of the box. It's the same checkout flow that BigCommerce gives you. Uh, you can just modify it to your taste, so you're not starting from scratch again, and that buys you a lot of time uh, versus a lot of the more complicated you know API based solutions out there where you have to build your own checkout from scratch. Uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility, sure, but you know. Uh, for, you know, for the, the sake of being efficient in a project, really a good thing. Um, so what would a workflow look like? Well, if you're a fan of GitOps, uh, or having your, your DevOps run through your, um, uh, versioning system as much as possible, it would look something like this. You would have a pull request for every feature that comes in. 
from your developers, merge that to a main branch, whether it's your uh, master develop branch, whatever you're using. And upon merging, you would run workflows. Um, so on GitHub, this is uh, done for GitHub Actions. And uh, Bitbucket has something similar with uh, pipelines, but no matter what you use as a versioning, so a hosted versioning solution, they have something like this. Um, you would have a build that runs as part of your workflow. So uh, that would be your, your npm run build command. So you just have some I don't know, Linux container that runs your build command and make sure that it doesn't error out. And then the second and last step is to deploy to WebDAV. And that's also doable within GitHub Actions. Also doable within Bit Bitbucket pipelines, I believe. But I'm, I'm going to cover GitHub here. This is the widely uh, used standard from what I've seen out there. Even though Travis uses Bitbucket, but that's a different topic. <laughs> so um, you would go get your WebDAV credentials in uh, BigCommerce. This is the stage again where you've built the code base. It looks great on your local. I'm oversimplifying it here and, and imagining that you're the only developer on the team uh, just for the sake of clarity. But now you're ready to deploy. Great. You go into your settings, advanced file access with BAV, get your setup detail. You're going to get credentials, which is an endpoint, a username and a password. And if you're using GitHub again, use GitHub Actions and you use this open source action by BXB100. Uh, this person actually made a, a very comprehensive WebDAV upload solution, super easy to use. And as you can see, this is all it takes to set it up. It's literally uh, uh, eight lines of, of YAML. So as easy as it gets. I have the link here uh, for you guys. I will, you know, the, the slides will be um, available afterwards for your reference of all the resources. But yeah, once you've done that, you know, you've got your, uh, got your checkout and it's ready and it's deployed and everybody can see it. Obviously, you're going to have to go back into your settings, checkout settings, change that uh, URL to the, the hosted URL uh, of your, your static package, but that's about it. So, got a case study here. Um, client is kind of secret, secret, but not too much, but it is. So, uh, all the logos are blowed out and all that, but uh, it is, you know, one of the biggest uh, luxury fashion consignment marketplaces, which uh, was a really interesting project to work on. The reason why Secret is also it's not really fully out yet. We're in, in beta, uh, so it's not like you know, not like I can mention uh, it left and right. But uh, they came to us with a problem. So the e-commerce functionality is that they have it's a marketplace, so uh, they're definitely a pure player, even though they have stores and all that. Too. Most of the money comes through the marketplace. They had e-commerce functionalities built on a completely custom backend, which uh, is quite hard to maintain. And, and especially for e-commerce, payment and order taking and all that creates an extra layer of, of uh, liability, right? You, you might be liable for PCI. Payments infrastructure is, is, is kind of more of a pain to maintain because you're interfacing with your payment gateway directly and all that. I, I, I've done these custom builds before. You know, a, a big part of them is, is not fun. So our solution, was to keep the custom built marketplace software, leverage big commerce for all e-commerce features uh, related to the cart and checkout. All of the rest would stay with their custom code, but we would be using Checkout.js to build a fully custom experience that would match the brand image, implement custom functionality at the checkout level, and kind of look like it belongs in the site, despite there being a redirect, obviously. And the result is a responsive, user-friendly, fast checkout experience that contributes to brand cohesiveness and minimizes the friction with customers. Again, you're being redirected, but the goal is to make sure that you don't notice. Customers land on the checkout. They're already logged in thanks to the SSO API provided by BigCommerce. The checkout leverages the client's middleware. They have a middleware for discount codes and, and all that. And the clients now have a BigCommerce instance that acts solely as a cart and checkout provider, which is less headache for them because they don't have to maintain these functionalities custom anymore, which was a, you know, a lot of dev work, but all without compromising on custom experience. That being said, got a video here because I wasn't going to give you only two screenshots. So we're here on the custom marketplace. So this is also a custom marketplace. This is the cart here. We're going to continue to check out. You see, we've got a, a, a timeout here. 
at the expiration of your cart. That's on their side and it's custom built. And you've seen here, we're in the big commerce custom checkout and the, the timeout is actually still here. It's linked back to that functionality they have on their own site, which is pretty cool. Again, it looks like you're still on the same website, even though now you're in big commerce world. So I'm going to go here and enter shipping address. Uh, John Doe lives in the UAE. That's where I'm based. Just entering the shipping address here. You can see all the, the fields, uh, custom fields. It matches their brand, you know, design language. It's completely to their own specifications. And, you know, although all checkouts kind of look the same in terms of functionality, at least it's always, you know, shipping delivery payments. It doesn't really look like big commerce. You know, it doesn't stream big commerce at least. And that, that was the goal here. Um, you can see, uh, we're going to the payment step and it's obviously a test credit card. Just gonna put a CVV, random CVV there. And place the order. And now we're back on their own website. Just a second. Development instance, kind of slow. Yeah, we're back on their own website to, uh, well, didn't last long there, but we're back on their own website to show the thank you page, which is again, hosted and controlled entirely by them. So we're not in big commerce anymore at this stage. So that's how you would, uh, that's how you would implement big commerce only as a call and checkout provider, or even in the context of a client that uses big commerce for the whole man yard, and, you know, they've got their storefront on it. They're using stencil, or they've got a, a, a headless storefront running somewhere that uses the, the storefront API. That's how you build a highly uh, customized checkouts using react and, uh, how you can gain full control over it. So you can try it out for yourself. I've got some resources here so you can get started easily. This is the, the repository for checkout JS. Check that out. Obviously, it's just, it's just starting, uh, your starting point and then, uh, two pages of documentation. There's obviously more available for you, uh, once you start to dig in, but, uh, this is where I would recommend starting. So that's about it. Thank you for your attention and, uh, I'll take any, uh, questions. Cheers, Lord. That was, that was really good. Um, I think we all want to go and build a checkout now. Um, so there's a couple of questions that have popped into the chat. Um, the first one, I think probably we're going to expect this one to come in, I'm sure. So, um, Eamon says PCI compliance has been the biggest barrier for my clients to get a custom checkout built. Um, is it a concern? Is there any way to mitigate it, uh, by not modifying certain parts? Is there any guidance at all? Right. So, um, most payment gateways will these days provide you with hosted fields. Uh, Braintree does that, Stripe does that with Stripe elements. And that's really your key to not being liable for, for PCI. Everything. This is not legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know anything about PCI. Don't ask me about PCI. But my opinion is that if you use hosted shield, you should be all right. Cause you're tokenizing the card and you're never touching the card data. You're never touching the customer data, at least not, 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 uh, you know, sensitive payment information. So this is how we've done it for this, uh, clients that I've shown. And, you know, they're using, uh, they're using hosted fields and, uh, there's, there's no worries about PCI compliance there. So everything's, uh, everything's all right by us on, on that side, as long as you use hosted fields. Yeah, that's, that's good disclaimer as well. Um, oh, there's already been a thank you put in there. Thanks so much. Another one we've got from Steven is how do you maintain your custom checkout? With the updates that get merged into checkout JS from big commerce, um, has noticed the, on any releases. Okay, so there's no releases on the um, on the checkout JS kind of channel. It, is there a way that you currently kind of handle up, well maintaining an updates of the custom checkouts that you build? Uh, there's not really any methodology. The, the the short answer is deal with it. <laughs> you know, if you want a custom checkout and you want to you want to use you know checkout JS, which which buys you a lot of time when building the project. Yeah, yes, uh, merging the upstream is probably going to be a little bit uh, uh, you know. Uh, not confusing, but probably time intensive. I agree that it's not really, I mean, that's the problem when you're forking a project, right? And you try to merge the upstream changes is there's always going to be a uh, conflict that you're going to have to manually resolve. And, and there's really no way to get out of this. You know, I've seen many open source projects where that was a problem as well. 
um, you know, this is this is really not the case just for Checkout JS. It's the case for you know a, a lot of other projects out there. So um, yeah, just uh, make sure that you're open with your clients uh, in terms of you know, hey, there's going to be a little bit of maintenance there, a little bit of ongoing maintenance, and as long as they approve that and they're okay, well, they're saving a whole bunch of time on the implementation by not building the whole thing from scratch. So yeah, I think it's a good trade-off. 